So I want to I want to actually move to some practical considerations, uh, and I think just for the audience that may not yet be familiar with treating these patients primarily, um, Michael, maybe you can talk to us about where patients get CAR T cell therapy and who administers this, and does this require hospitalization at this time? Uh, yeah, that's a very important question, and, and David and Steve have, have lead, uh, alluded to the fact that um, uh, on target but um, non-tumor side effects can lead to a lot of complications associated with CAR T's that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. Um, but uh, it, many of the trials that have been designed to administer this agent have been based on mainly doing this as an inpatient procedure. But what, we've, what we found is that a, a decent number of patients can be treated outpatient and have this as an outpatient infusion. Um, but I think we're, we're transitioning right now. It's going to differ depending on which car you're using. It's going to, it's, it, uh, because some cars can have very early fevers and other toxicities. Other cars have much less of a chance of having significant toxicities. So that particular question that you ask, Krish, is, is something that we're, we're actually really resolving. Some um, are designing this to be given as an outpatient, and others may need to be given inpatient. And I think, to be fair, so far, most of the patients who have been treated, other than at very highly specialized centers, have been managed uh, mostly in the inpatient setting. So I think it, as we better understand the complications and who will develop those complications, I think we will see a transition. But the vast majority of patients, at least initially, will likely be treated in the inpatient setting. Um, I want to I move uh, to, to, I think, another practical point that's in, uh, general across these products, which is what about the timing required to you know, to produce these cells. And Steve, especially as a lymphoma expert, sometimes where you see rapidly yeah. growing yeah. disease, how does that yeah. timing vary and, and how does that affect the therapy? It's, uh, I mean, uh, I think currently the products uh, can be prepared within 17 to 22 days, depending on um, um, which car uh, you're talking about. And uh, uh, that seems like a relatively short period of time, but in, in a very sick patient, it, you know, who uh, has a rapidly progressing um, disease, it could be uh, a critical amount of time. So, so um, in, in some cases, patients get what we call bridging therapy, therapy to stabilize them uh, prior to getting the lymphodepletion chemotherapy that we give prior to giving the car cell infusions. So it can be challenging at times. And it's, it's not necessarily the you know, 17 to 22 days that's the problem, it's also the production slots. How many products can you make at the same time in a given facility? So. A facility may not be able to accept products because they're making uh, as many as they can at that point in time. So it's one thing to talk about how many days it takes to make a car cell. It seems rather short, but it, the logistics are different. And it can be long, and it can be challenging to manage these patients um, uh, in preparation for this therapy. Well, one important point I think that needs to be made with that is that um, when we have very complex and, and resistant malignancies, our tendency is meant to treat them incredibly intensely, get, them, get patients into the best remission possible. And one thing we're finding is that CARs are so potent, we may not need patients to be in a deep remission prior to giving their CARs. Um, we've kind of changed our philosophy with ALL to keep the patient alive, give them therapy that controls the disease but don't hurt them prior to giving the car because we, we we all know we have drop-off of patients who are not able to get the cars because they get too sick or they have fatal complications prior to the car so we're really changing the way we think about these patients. And that's exactly the way we've been ap approaching the lymphoma patients. Uh, um, the idea is to stabilize the patient, keep them in good shape, but not to try to achieve a, a deep remission. The, the cars are the therapy that's aimed at getting the patients into remission. But I, also, I also think it's important to remember it's, it's the total package. So we're, we're all starting from when we're going to give the cars, but in reality it starts with getting the patient on the service, evaluating their disease, dealing with their insurance, then collecting yeah. the cells by apheresis, sending them off to you know, whoever's going to make the cells or make them in your own facility, then waiting the 17 to you know, whatever days to get the cells back then giving lymphodepleting chemotherapy, the, the CARs, and then observing the patient over the next month. So the treatment course is still, is still on, the, on par with a, like an autologous transplant is the best way I think, think about it. And, and it does require you know, this be, to be done in specialized centers. And I think great, all great points that you made. And the only other thing I would add to that is that as we look at the trial results, some of these trials 
allowed bridging therapy and some did not. And we should you know, make sure that as we interpret those trial results that we consider that because obviously a trial where a patient was not allowed to get bridging therapy might end up with a different patient subset than, than one where bridging therapy was allowed. And that's important going forward as well.